Buddy Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. Well, it's Tuesday here on this program, and you know what that means. we got a lot to get into here today, including the first ever post-Vince McMahon edition of Monday Night Raw. And how was it? Well, it was a Raw show. I could say that it wasn't stupid. I mean, it wasn't like a great three-hour program because it's almost impossible to do. But, you know, we had some good wrestling. We had some bad wrestling. We had some uh, baby faces that were booed. You know, the usual. So we'll get into that here today on the program, your full Raw report. We've also got news on Vince McMahon. We've got the full lineup for the SummerSlam pay-per-view, which is coming up this Saturday, everybody. Saturday is SummerSlam. We got the lineup for the show. And at this point, there are nine matches scheduled for this show. So this is going to be one of those long ones. We'll tell you about that, plus a meeting that Triple H had before Raw on Monday night, what he told everybody. We got the Dynamite uh, lineup. We got the Rampage ratings. We've got the SmackDown ratings. Obviously, SmackDown did a huge number because news was out that Vince McMahon had, in his words, retired. What actually happened is he resigned. But uh, quite frankly, the SmackDown number was a great number, but I thought it would do way more because of what happened with Vince. But still, a uh, an excellent number. Best audience for the show since June 17, which was, in fact, the day that Vince showed up after announcing he was stepping away as chairman and CEO. So uh, we'll talk about that, plus uh, plenty of other news as well. If you would like to text us here today, we got uh, plenty of time. 425-780-7566. That is 425-780-7566. When we come back, I got news on Vince that you'll only hear on this program. Back in a moment. Observer Live. Also, WrestlingObserver.com, I want to mention that not only is SummerSlam this weekend, but StarCast. Ric Flair's LastMatch.com, all the details on Star, uh, StarCast. The week actually gets started this coming Friday, July 29th, with the roast of Ric Flair. Following day, panels with Brian Danielson, Claudio Castagnoli, a horseman reunion, Bret Hart talking SummerSlam 92. On Sunday, Paige, Foley, Nash, Hardy... And more. We've got pictures, autographs, conventions, wrestling shows. We've got Black Label Pro, GCW taking place on Friday, New Japan's coming up on Saturday, Ric Flair's last match at the Nashville Municipal Auditorium. It's coming up on Sunday. $39 for tickets to Ric Flair's last match on the show. Briscoes versus Von Eriks. Carrie and Ricky Morton versus Brian Pillman Jr. and Brock Anderson. Motor City Machine Guns and the Wolves. Josh Alexander and Jacob Fatu. Killer Cross and Harry Smith. Red Narita. Actually, I don't know if Clark Connors is on the show. I believe that Clark Connors is injured. I could be wrong. He's off about the that. show. Yeah. But anyway, at Rickflair's last match.com, if you want tickets, as noted, $39 gets you in to see the final match in the career of Ric Flair, so check it out. Uh, there's also documentaries you can check out, episode one and two, which actually leads to the setup for the match for uh, for Flair's final match. So check it out. That'll be uh, this weekend, and of course SummerSlam as well. We'll get into the lineup for that show in a moment. But I promised news, exclusive news on Vince McMahon, only for listeners of this show. And really, only listeners of this show will understand the gravity of what I'm about to say. Are you ready? Yes. You ready, Mike? You ready? Are yeah. you ready? Yeah. I'm traveling tomorrow. I won't be here to do the show tomorrow. A last-minute thing came up. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, so yeah. So you know what that means. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know what that means. I know! I... I don't know what that means. You know well, what I know that, that means. I know that means you have to review NXT 2.0. But yes, on top of that, it is it is every single time, every single time that I have traveled, okay, a monumental shift in the structure of WWE has occurred every single time. So, th- th- one of two things is going to happen tomorrow. This is like uh, CM Punk versus Ryback. 
either tomorrow there's going to be a monumental shift in the structure of WWE because I'm traveling, or the streak will be broken. So I guess we're going to find out. You want to take a bet, Mike? Is something going to happen tomorrow or not? Yes. Yeah, it's inevitable. Well, the odds are in my favor, so I might as well go ahead and, and hope that because then it also provides me with more YouTube views when you put. Yeah, up bro, you should segment, be happy so. when I travel because you're you have so much material every time I'm out of here because something always goes down. God, maybe maybe Dunn will be axed. If he gets axed, I may have to do the show from the car. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's bigger news to me than Vince stepping down. Bro, listen, I was watching Raw last night, and we'll mm-hmm. get into the Raw report in a minute. And yeah. Raw was not uh, uh, monumentally different, okay? It was largely the exact same show. But uh, that the, yeah. first th- the first 30 seconds of that show where there's a brawl in the ring, and they're just doing cut, 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 cut. I was like, bro, we got to get rid of this guy. And yeah. somebody, somebody told me that, you know, uh, just so you know, there's a pretty decent chance that if they get rid of Kevin Dunn, you're still going to see the cuts, which was very depressing to me. Well. But I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that perhaps, perhaps, no matter who is responsible, the Triple H watches that show, and being a, uh, a man in his early 50s, he's, his, maybe his eyes are starting to kind of go a little bit. And maybe he kind of gets, you know, whatever. He'll just go, we can't do this anymore, dude. It's done. No it's more of these his camera heart cuts. Rate, uh, you know, everything gives Not his heart, now, but or... hey, listen, listen, I'll be honest with everybody. I'm 47 years old. And you know you what are. I noticed a little while ago? What? My, 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 my vision up close is not very good anymore. Mine too. Yeah. That it's sucks. True. Yeah. So like, you know, I, I, sucks. I have perfect vision here, but then, oh, now it's getting blurry. Now it's yeah. getting blurry. Now I, I can't see a thing on my hand. And then, you know, it gets dark in the room, and I can't see very well when, the, when it gets dark. And then when I go outside, it's too bright. I'm going to be that guy that wears sunglasses on the show in about five years because it's just everything's so bright. But the point is, you get a little older, and your eyes get a little weird and everything like that. So uh, I, I can't watch this stuff. S- s- this needs to change. You understand? It's got to change. Also, do you also hate those new headlights? Those things are way too bright at night, beaming at you with the dry eye and all that stuff. It sucks. No, nah, it doesn't it bother sucks. me. That one but really you know, I, I got LASIK, everybody. So I have I have perfect vision everywhere except really, really close. And I don't know if uh, any of you that got LASIK uh, notice this as well, but there are certain colors of blue that look really bizarre at night. Like really? blue neon. Yeah, it's weird. Huh. Like every, every other color is like perfectly in focus, but, but blue neon... It just is like, uh, you know what it looked like? It looked like uh, the entrance of, um, who did that entrance? Axiom. Huh. Looks Looked like Axiom's entrance when I see that that weird blue. Anyway, I got more news, and uh, the first thing I want to mention is yesterday on Observer Radio, I talked about uh, the flight that Nick Wayne and his mother were on uh, on the way back from uh, Progress. Uh, they, they apparently had left from Germany and were heading to Seattle, and they were over the ocean, and all of a sudden, uh, there was a bomb threat that was reported. And the plane turned around and landed in Iceland. And somebody had scrawled on the mirror either bomb or explosion. It's not clear what they had scrawled. But uh, so here's the thing. If, if let's say that, you're on an airplane and you receive word as a pilot that there is a credible bomb threat, okay? But you're you're hearing it from wherever, okay? That's different than if you are on the plane and you inspect everything, and then as the plane is in the air, somebody scrawls something on the mirror. That means that whoever scrawled it is on the airplane, okay? So basically, they didn't know who scrawled the threat on the mirror. And so when they landed, man, I was just told everybody, everybody was treated as if they were guilty. And they were sequestered into this tiny little uh, hotel. They weren't allowed to talk. They weren't allowed to use their phones. They weren't allowed to charge their phones. 
and everybody was searched. The plane was searched. His poor mother, who was in a state already because she was on a plane with a bomb threat, she gets like, uh, you know, the super interrogation because she had a little thing of like eyeliner or whatever. And apparently they'd used eyeliner or lipstick or whatever to write it on the mirror. So, of course, they think that she must be one of the suspects. So they grilled her forever. And as of, I think, an hour and a half ago, they were still in Iceland. No idea how they're going to get back. No idea when they're going to get back. No idea about anything. And since they weren't allowed to charge their phones, their phones were all dying. So I don't know what's going on. But, I mean, the good news is they're on the ground and they're safe, okay? She was given the impression from one of the officers that there was actually a bomb on the plane. Uh, the the person who gave her that information I think uh, there may have been some miscommunication because there have been news stories out about this and none of them have mentioned that there actually was a bomb on the plane. So my guess is there wasn't. But uh, she, when she was talking to them, got the impression that they were telling her that there actually was a bomb on the plane. So that's all I can tell everybody right now. The story's out. Uh, There was a story on Slam Wrestling about it yesterday, but that's all the news I have. As of right now, and that's a that's a scary story. Well, I guess we'll find out a lot about Iceland maybe uh, when they get back, of which I know nothing other than the Olympics were held in Reykjavik and Bjork. Thank you, Mike. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Why don't we do Raw real quick? All right. So just so you all know, for those of you that were expecting way more than happened here today, This uh, Raw show was written uh, last week and approved by Vince on Thursday. And uh, the good news is he didn't show up Monday to rip it up. But uh, with a couple of exceptions, this was largely still a Vince McMahon show. And it's going to be a while before you see real changes. You're going to see some changes. But uh, I remain very bullish about everything. And uh, Triple H did do a meeting before the show and... You know, basically told everybody he wanted it to be fun for them to come to work. He promised transparency. He said if you wanted to talk to him, he would talk to you. And people, you know, the wrestlers were generally pretty excited about the change. And we had Lance Storm on the show today, and he worked there uh, at one point when Vince was working on the XFL. He was there as a producer. And he said that uh, there were a lot of shows where Vince wasn't there and Triple H was in charge. And he said when Triple H was in charge, everybody was so much happier. And now the uh, whatever Vince called himself, the calm, serene force at Gorilla, that, uh, that quite frankly, tornado is gone. And I think that in the uh, long run, it's going to be a big positive for everybody, even if it just leads to people being happier to go to work. So it opened up with the brawl with Miz and Logan Paul, which had too many camera cuts. And it was quick. They got out of there, and that was that. Then we had Roman Reigns, Usos, and Paul Heyman coming down to the ring. Paul Heyman did the promo, hyping up SummerSlam. Roman Reigns talked about Brock Lesnar. And then out came Theory. Because in case you uh, are unaware, Vince was really high on this Theory guy. And since he wrote this show, Theory's on for about 45 minutes every time. So first, Theory does a promo. And then Roman Reigns makes a comment about how your daddy's not here anymore, referring to Vince. She's got a who's your daddy chant. Big pops for Roman Reigns. They're leaving. Austin Theory hits Jay Uso with the briefcase. Jay totally doesn't sell this briefcase shot. And he wants to get in a fight, but Reigns holds him back, and away they go. It was a good, it was a good promo segment. Uh, Paul Heyman was great, and Roman Reigns is good in his role. Then we had Drew McIntyre versus Theory. Had a lot of people upset because they were like, my oh, God, the first the first Raw after Vince, the first match goes to... Well, first off, this was a Vince show. And yes, the first match did uh, go to a DQ. But it went to a DQ to set up a tag match. So it was uh, Drew versus Theory. And then, uh, you know, all the guys ran in. Uh, Sheamus, Ridge Hall, and Butch. So they set up the tag match with Bobby Lashley and Drew versus Theory and Sheamus. What about 12 minutes? Match was... Fine, depending on who was in there. You know, they're still having Theory work in the most boring manner possible as they're trying to give him this big push. Lots of chin locks and etc. And then finally he's going for his finish. Dolph Ziggler shows up at ringside and Theory is distracted, gets put in the hurt lock, taps immediately. 
because he doesn't want to uh, be injured going into his match with Bobby Lashley for the title on Sunday or Saturday. And he also wants to cash in, obviously. So that's why he tapped quickly. And segment was fine, but it was one of those raw things where we're only going to use 20 wrestlers out of the 500 we have. And so let's just stretch everything out as as long as, as humanly possible. But if you like those guys, you got a lot of them. We had a Rey Mysterio video package, which was excellent. We had the Rey Mysterio 20th anniversary celebration. Dominic did not turn on his father. Rey Mysterio was allowed to go out there, and for like 10 minutes, he talked about his career. He thanked people that he owed his career to, including Dean Malenko, who works for AEW, Conan, who pretty much since about 1993 has been on the outs with the WWE, Batista, Kurt Angle, Edge, Eddie Guerrero, and the fans chant, you deserve it, it was really great, and Dominic's, you know, clapping for his dad, he's all excited, Ray's practically in tears, and they gave him his 20th anniversary moment. And then afterwards, Finn Balor and Damian Priest showed up because they were going to have a match. And uh, they go 10 minutes, and Rey Mysterio, clean in the middle of the ring, hits a frog splash, pins Finn Balor, and they win the match. I was like, my God, anything else? And, of course, they did have to get some heat because they do have a tag match on uh, Sunday. But, you know, this... This is not something they normally do, especially for a guy like Ray. Just give him so much and let him actually have a great, happy moment. So I was, I was very happy with this segment for Ray because, you know, when the fans chant "You deserve it" because somebody won a belt, I'm always like, "What are you talking about?" But when they chant "You deserve it" for Ray's 20-year celebration, I like that because you know what, Ray does deserve it. So then they go backstage, and now it's time for the heat. Ray's back there with his family, and his daughter, Ali has got a present for him. He opens it up, and it is the gear from Halloween Havoc 1997, where he faced Eddie Guerrero in a mask versus title match, which he was supposed to lose, but he won. It was an 11-minute match. I gave it five stars, probably the best 11-minute match you'll ever see. He got the gear. He went, my God, I've, I've been looking. Where did you find this? And Aliyah said something like, wasn't easy. But he's looking at the gear, he's all excited, and then Rhea Ripley shows up. And Aaliyah gets in her face, the uh, Balor and Priest attack the Mysterios, they put Ray through a table. Finn Balor notes, it's not your anniversary, it's my birthday! And they beat him up and left him for dead. So somehow this leads to a no-disqualification match on Sunday, which I don't know how that leads to that, but that's what they're doing. We did Bianca, Becky Lynch, quick segment and brawl, which was a very good brawl. And uh, Becky Lynch took a swing at Hurricane during this brawl. So, uh, you know, maybe he deserves it. Who knows? Alexa Bliss promo does all the goofy stuff talking about the doll. But then she has to get serious. And she looks directly into the camera. And she cuts a promo on Bianca and Becky. And she said, I don't care who wins Sunday, I'm coming for that title. She also mentioned she was a five-time champion, which I'm sure is true, but there's a lot of belts, and a lot of people have won them in this company. Alexa Bliss, do drop, four minutes, no heat whatsoever. Alexa hit her with a DDT, pinned her, and that was that. Then we had the Logan Paul segment. I think you guys probably know what happened. Logan Paul came out. He attempted to be a babyface. The fans booed him. And then the weird thing was... All of a sudden, Maurice comes out. And Maurice comes out, she goes, don't you dare ever talk about my children. And I was like, he didn't say a word about your kids. He didn't say one word about your children. So apparently they'd written something that he forgot to say. And I, I can't figure out what he would have said about her children if their idea is that he's supposed to be a baby face. Because, dude, you don't say anything about people's kids if you want to be a baby face. That was what began... Or one of the things that began the fans turning on Sammy Guevara when he made a comment about, uh, forget whose kids it was, but he goes, nobody, nobody gives a damn about your kids or whatever, and everybody starts booing him, even though he's supposed to be a babyface. So Miz and Maurice show up, and uh, Ciampa attacks Logan Paul. Logan Paul uh, fights back, but then Miz gives Logan Paul the skull-crushing finale, at which point the fans chant, 
one more time because they hate Logan Paul. And yes, it was uh, Ethan Page who was a heel. Babyface Sammy Guevara made a comment about heel Ethan Page's kids, and they all turned on Sammy Guevara and cheered Ethan Page. Because you don't say anything about people's kids. We had AJ and Dolph Ziggler beating the Alpha Academy, which was a, it was a pretty good match. I mean, Styles is great, and Dolph's good, and Alpha Academy is, you know, Chad Gable's great. Otis is funny. So uh, Ziggler hit a zigzag, double team on Gable, pinned him. And so that was that. And then finally, the main event, Roman Reigns and uh, the Usos versus Riddle and the Street Profits. Dude, there was nothing wrong with the work in this match. Everybody in the match is good, but it was 20 minutes, which meant 18 minutes of it was just getting heat on the baby faces one at a time. We get the heat on Riddle. He makes a tag. We get the heat on Montez. He makes a tag. We... Uh, get a he- get the heat on Dawkins. And finally, Riddle makes the last hot tag with like a couple of minutes left. He's running wild. He uh, is going for his uh, DDT or his RKO. He hit the DDT on Reigns. Goes for the RKO. Reigns spears him, pins him. He's left for dead. And then Seth Rollins comes out and gives him a stomp in the ring and a stomp on the ring step. So basically, if you look at what happened on the show, there really was little that you would describe as like stupid incompetent it was a show that was too long it was a basic show building up all of the matches for SummerSlam they largely did a fine job building everything up the matches I mean they just have to drag everything out over three hours so it's not a bad show it's certainly not a great show by any means but it was for a three-hour show fine And hopefully it continues to improve because next week's script won't be written by Vince. He'll never be there to tear up the script again. I mean, don't expect, like, super changes overnight. But I think that as things go by, I think the show's going to really improve and SmackDown as well. One simple fix would be getting rid of any remnants of the brand split. You don't have enough top talent to do that. And you have guys like Walter that can be utilized anywhere. I would say I would want those Intercontinental and U.S. titles merged together. I don't know if they'll do that, but that would be one of the things I would do. And after the break, we can get into it more. We'll get more Mike Sots after the break, bros. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Any other thoughts from the Raw Show Monday? Yeah, I see a lot of people talking about Austin Theory and him being buried and him being them them being done with him and all that I know what I believe to be the case and what should be the case is you need to now rebuild Austin Theory because look at how this guy has been portrayed a lot when has he been portrayed as the most serious he could be it was for a few moments when he was standing next to uh, Seth Rollins, when Seth was going to get his cult together and Buddy Murphy was there, like Buddy Matthews, whatever. Like, that's as serious as he's been. He's been the kid of the Garganos. He's been this Vince weird guy that takes selfies and has been a goofball. Like, that's not how you build somebody up. Again, the things that people remember and want to gloss about like a John Cena build or something like that about, well, he did these goofy things. No, look, I don't care if he was touched by Vince here, which is a bad way to say things, but whether he was Vince's handpicked guy or not, how he has portrayed Austin Theory has been goofy and I don't think has worked and certainly has not peaked him to the potential where he should be right now, especially if you're going to spend this much time on, on the show with him. So to tear him down a little bit and have these guys like a Lashley or a Drew McIntyre, or a Dolph Ziggler, which I know is tired for a lot of people, but these these older guys who are sharks in the water here, like, they should be the ones that now tear this guy down a little bit, and he's got to hold his own against him and build himself back up, because that's the only way people are going to actually believe this guy. 
Long term, that's the only way they're going to do it because he does not have a cool factor like Roman Reigns. He doesn't have that. So the longer he goes and is not over and the more they push him as one of the few stars, it's not going to work. And I think one of the ways you can do that is by having a six or an eight pack of people, usually it's six, that you can rely on. And I know people are tired of the names right now to hear Lashley or McIntyre or Sheamus or Ziggler or, or Kevin Owens. But you know what? If you amplify those guys, you bring Walter in, you bring in somebody maybe from NXT, a couple of people maybe that have been forgotten about. That was always a great Paul Heyman thing to bring guys up that people T-Bar that somebody has forgotten about. Put a new coat of paint on them and give them an existence and a reason to be there. And without Vince there, you should not have the concern about giving up on something after two, three, four weeks. So that is a simple change that can be made that I think would help matters. And as, again, Sheamus falls off, hopefully you have a, let's just say, Braun Breaker or whoever it is that you bring up, you have them there to kind of slide up and be that person. And again, getting rid of the brand split, as you've argued for a long time, would help matters immensely because without Brock, without Reigns there, you might as well have Drew and Sheamus and, and Butch and everybody over on Raw, and you might as well have it the same way on SmackDown when it comes to the women and any other help that, you know, Alpha Academy that can be given on that side. Well, here's the deal. This brand split, I mean, I, I talked months ago that the brand split was basically done. And then, you know, there was a correction from someone within WWE. Well, it's still there. We're just not really... A... Bro, the brand, the brand split's already done. Like, there's people that show up on both shows. It's all done. Here's the thing with this theory, bloke. I got nothing against the guy, okay? But I think it would be a disaster to have him become champion at SummerSlam. Oh, God, I should yes. say it. I shouldn't say it. It would be a disaster. No, like they're it's not going to go out of business or whatever. Way to end. Reigns has got a 700 plus day reign, and you have presented this guy like this. No, flat out, well, it's not the time. And any wrestling look, nobody's wrestling instincts should pop for that. Nobody's. Well, listen, I don't know. I don't know what they were going to do on Saturday. But I do know that Vince has devoted 45 minutes of television time on every show in the last month to Austin Theory. So much time, okay? I also, having watched WWE for a long time, I, uh, I know how this guy thinks a lot of times, but not every time, okay? And if you pay attention on SmackDown... Brock Lesnar beat the holy hell out of Austin Theory. On Raw, Roman Reigns beat the holy hell out of Austin Theory. So you're telling me that Vince's idea was to spend all this time on this guy, beat him up on the SmackDown Go Home Show, beat him up on the Raw Go Home Show, and then beat him on Saturday? I'm not saying, okay? That was, that was not Vince's idea, but Vince is not there. No, Vince Vince did write this, this show Monday, okay? You're right. So, You're right. I don't know if his idea was to put the title on him Saturday, but I have seen him build people up for titles before, and this is totally his wheelhouse, okay? Now, here's the big question. Let's say that Vince's whole idea was to build this dude up to uh, go in there Saturday. Brock and Roman kill each other. He cashes in. Or you, you guys remember my idea? Did I mention my idea on this show? Because I'm the king of horrible ideas? Yes, which was. Okay. My idea is this. I'm not advocating this idea, okay? Brock and Roman are doing their match, and they're just killing each other. And uh, something happens, and both of them fall into a hole or whatever, and then a bunch of stuff fall on top, so they're both trapped in the hole, okay? They're both trapped in the hole. The ref goes, one, two, three. Yes, I'm going to count to eight. Four. I've got to have the drama here. Five. You're like, my God, they can't get out of this hole. Six. Six. Seven. seven. And all of a sudden, Austin Theory's music hits. He runs down to the ring. 
He gives the referee the briefcase. He stands in the ring. The ref goes, eight, nine, ten. Oh, no. And new. <laughs> so he did nothing but stand in the ring. This is so, this is such Vince's wheelhouse. This guy, this guy that you're supposed to hate, backdoored his way into this title. So anyway, that's what I figured they were going to do. I, I have Vince no McMahon idea. Vince or Vince Russo there. I have uh, no idea what Vince's plan was <laughs> other than whatever. But listen, it doesn't matter because guess what? Now he's gone. Okay? So all I know is if I'm Triple H, nothing against the guy, but it's not his time. And I realize that a lot of people in the history of wrestling have become champion when it seemed like it was too early, and they finally sort of made it work, even though it was early. You know, when Brock Lesnar was called up from Ohio Valley, it was way too early. But he made it work. Kurt Angle was called up too early. He made it work. I mean, I suppose it's possible Austin Theory could make it work. But to me, it's not time. He's not ready. He should not be the undisputed universal champion with all of the top belts. And so I would make a change if that was Vince's plan, and I would not have him win that title. It's just not time. He's not the guy right now. You're ex- exactly, exactly. And I know that's always been one of Vince's tells is to do something like that. It's like having somebody beat Giants on the way up to conquering the top of the mountain. But as you mentioned with Theory, it is just not the time. And him losing, frankly, if he's going to catch it, cash it in, will do more for him long-term because you do, to me, have to strip him back down and build him up a little bit. Him beating Brock Lesnar or Roman Reigns right now, it's just, it doesn't make any sense. And to me, if you want to keep the briefcase on him, that's fine. Let him continue to ride with it. But you've got to figure out a way to build more credibility behind that guy as you go along with this. And it just showcases, again, how bad they need fresh stars to get elevated up. And I don't know who those people are other than names like there is Braun Breaker. I think Carmelo Hayes' future is now a lot brighter now that somebody else is in charge. Same thing with a guy like a Giovanni Vinci. I think if those guys get called up to the main roster, I'm not going to say it's going to move heaven and earth or anything like that, but I think guys of that size are going to have a better possibility, as are the guys like a Braun Breaker. Look, Von Wagner, they obviously like because of his size. They've let him actually talk here a little bit, you know, as as we see what happens with Robert Stone. But, like, those types of guys coming up, they need to be cracked into the, the, the tier here at some point. And I don't think you can wait until the Royal Rumble for that. I do hope they start making some sort of moves and bringing some people up and freshening things up and not having it be people like Mandy Rose. Because with all due respect, unless you're going to bring up Mandy Rose, put her on the main roster with Sonya and they make them a tag team, I'm great with that. If you're going to bring up to have them feud, I've already seen it. I don't want to see it. And I've seen what Mandy can do in NXT, and she still cannot cut a promo worthy enough to be on the main roster to take up 10 minutes of time. She still doesn't have a match that makes me want to see her any more than you, a number of women on that roster. So bringing up the right people from NXT, too, not just because it's time to bring them back up again because you don't want to cut them. I'm sorry. You know, there's other things they can do. Be on the coconut loop. Be on level up. Do other things. But I don't want to see the same projects over and over again when we've seen projects like Mad Cat Moss, who's still got a crappy name, who should go back to being Riddick Moss, still never get an opportunity or his shot. Hey, let me say something, by the way. So I know... One of the reasons they're so behind Austin Theory is because he's young. And uh, I've heard many times, this is always my favorite, well, they know they got to do this, but then they actually don't do it, okay? So I've heard this about you know, Austin Theory. We, we, they know they need, we know we need young stars, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Until this whole thing happened with uh, whatever the hell they're doing with MJF, okay? Correct me if I'm wrong. MJF was one of the hottest stars in all of AEW, right? Facts. Okay. With the exception of the uh, diamond, dynamite diamond ring, which he won several times, with, with the exception of that, he never 
won a title at AEW. He never was the AEW champion. No. He never was the AEW TNT champion. No. He was never one half of the tag team champions. No. Yet he, as a young a young 24-year-old, I think he's 25 now, he was by far one of the biggest stars. He was the, one of the biggest, at times he was the biggest ratings mover in the entire company. The, the issue is not young people need to be the champion. The issue is we need young, fresh faces in the top mix. So if you want to shove Austin Theory, if you want to push him, great. That doesn't mean that he needs to be the undisputed universal champion and literally the centerpiece of the shows because he's not ready right now. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't do anything with him. That doesn't mean he can't be in a top spot. It doesn't mean he can't main event, semi-main event shows or main event Raw or whatever. But he doesn't need to be the champion for you to be pushing younger guys. Theory and Moss both need to be taken care of because they are at different points in their careers with different types of trajectories, but they are two people that they need to bank on short-term and long-term. And the more you take care of somebody now, the more it's going to pay off for you later. And a lot of that is believability. And a lot of that is having stock put into you by the fans. And I don't know. Mosses seems to be going up. I don't know if theories is there. And the response from MSG, I'm sorry. I know people think New York is overrated. It still means something. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. Also of WrestlingObserver.com. Well, everyone's favorite show is tonight. Very disappointed. I'm not going to be able to uh, review it tomorrow on the program, Mike. But uh, I'm glad that you will get a chance to uh, to do so. Do you think they're going to have one of those video packages that they set up for Rey Mysterio last night? Do you think they'll have that for the career of Sophia Cromwell in NXT? Do you think they'll no. have a big goodbye segment for her now that she is a maximum female model? Maxine Dupree. No, wait, it's Maxine, Maxine Dupree. That's Dupree. Maybe they can stop doing that since uh, this bro's gone. Vince McMahon. Hey, by the way, Filthy Tom. First G1 block match. Lost to Lance Archer. I have not seen it yet. How was it? I saw it. I saw it. Look, he was it was pretty good. He went back to the well too many times trying for that choke. Archer's oh. a big man. Wore him down, and that worries me a little bit. He's got Jonah coming up here in the next couple of days on 30th. And that worries me because he is in the monster block. And when Okada is the the lightest guy to be throwing around there. I'm starting to worry here a little bit. I know it's only been one day, and I got all the faith in the world in filthy Tom Lawler. But that was a little tough to watch. Well, I'm going to be watching that tonight, as well as NXT 2.0 with Zoe Stark, Wesley versus Grayson Waller, Apollo Crews versus Zion Quinn, and Diamond Mine and Tony D'Angelo's family will collide for an epic eight-man tag team Where's match. Stratton? No Stratton? Coming up tonight. Come on, at least give me Tiffany sure Stratton. Uh, get out of here, Mike. I'll see you on Thursday, everybody. Wrestling Observer Live.